Paul said, therefore, based on what he's taught in chapters 1 and 2, when we could endure it no longer, which he's explained in chapters 1 and 2, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone in order to send Timothy, our brother and fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you. Remember, that was that Paul, after three weeks with that, converting that, those people to Christ and trying to establish a, a Bible study group with them, was forced out of the city and left behind them uh, young converts. And he was really concerned about that, that he hadn't felt that he'd spent enough time with them to secure them well enough for the angelic conflict that would come because of their relationship with Christ. And you remember, he felt he had left them like orphans. You remember, he discussed that. And, and so he has sent Timothy back to the church, to the uh, mission field, to strengthen and encourage the young converts as to their faith. So that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions persecuted for the sake of Christ. For you yourself know that we have been destined for this. If you have a study Bible, you're probably going to look at Philippians 129 or something similar to that, where he tells you it, it has been granted for you to suffer, not only to believe, but to suffer for Christ, not just to believe in him. And he, he calls it, you have been destined. You have been destined for this. But Peter, when he writes about it in the first chapter and then, and then in the fifth, in the, his first book, he tells him, you shouldn't be surprised for the afflictions that come to your life because of your testimonial life and words on behalf of Jesus Christ. You shouldn't be surprised. Why? Because you've been taught. You've been taught, so it shouldn't come to a surprise to you. Well, he goes on, he says, for indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer afflictions. We call that the angelic conflict, just to give you a term of doctrine. And so it came to pass, as you know, for this reason, when I could endure it no longer. Have you heard that before? In verse one, <laughs> come on now. When we could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith. In other words, he wants uh, Timothy to go in. Timothy, I want you to go in and strengthen and encourage them in their faith. And I want you to write me a report on wh how well they have done in our absence. I want you to write what they're concerned about doctrinally. What do we need to feed them back? And so I want you to write me a report on where they stand in regards to their faith for fear that the tempter, we know that's the devil, the tempter might have tempted you and our labors would be in vain. That once he put the pressure on them, they would crumble rather than pick up the sword and fight. You know, and listen, this was a common problem to such a degree that Paul wrote a great deal on it the book of Ephesians. He found when he had a, a pastor's conference uh, that this was a common problem. And he writes back to the book of Ephesians from that conference. He writes that back. And he says, look. And so he gives you this. This is where this whole deal comes in, the full armor of God. It, it's a very... And, and listen, I, I don't know probably of any Bible teaching church that doesn't teach their children the full armor of God because it's such a picturesque way to teach it, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it really is. But that full armor of God is a dynamic idea about how the church has to be equipped to fight successfully in the angelic conflict put on the full armor of God. And then he, he talks in detail about it. Um, 
I say talks in detail. He talks in terms of categorical doctrine. Everything he talks about the full armor of God is, is given by doctrinal statements. Like he says, the, put on the full armor of righteousness. That's a whole doctrine. I mean, these aren't just ideas. These are doctrinal ideas. He gives you a word that carries a whole doctrinal understanding. So Paul, that's kind of what Paul is concerned about. He's been concerned about everywhere he went. I mean, he got people converted, was able to stay long enough, just three weeks, he was able to stay with them to kind of ground them a little bit on what they could expect and, and what, what, how he could equip them well enough to survive. Then he's run out of town. The whole team has run out of town. And... Uh, when things calm down, Paul has been concerned about him. He sends back, he spent, sends back t Timothy uh, with the understanding, I could stand it no longer. I mean, and uh, I mean, he's kind of waiting to let things settle down to send Timothy back in so they do he doesn't send Timothy back into a heavy firefight. And he said, look, you know, maybe I could have waited, but I can't wait any longer. I've got to send him back. I'm so concerned about your well-being. And shows Paul's compassion uh, for the mission. I mean, he just didn't go to a, a mission field and leave it. He said, even though I'm absent from you in body, I am with you in spirit. And we certainly see that. And it teaches a great deal as a church. It's easy to start missions, but is it easy to keep up with them? It's not hard to send a missionary to a field. But can you equip him properly? Do you stay in touch with him? And are you concerned about his well-being on that mission field? Say, uh, I hope we are. Uh, we try to be. Uh, we try to do everything in our power to help these guys that we have, our four missionaries that are out there on the front field with boots on the field. Uh, we try to do that. Uh, and uh, we try to equip him in every way we can equip him. Uh, they're the guys out there. They're the, they're the commanders on the field. They're the ones that, and, and so we like reports too. What do you need? How is it going? Uh, we, we need to be encouraged uh, about their ministries. Well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into this uh, study on uh, Paul. I titled it Strengthen and Encourage on the Mission Field. D to remind us, we just came off of a, uh, and you did wonderful raising support for our four missionaries uh, during the month of February. And, and I wanted to study Thessalonians, the book of it, just because we were going through it ourselves with it. So let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. They should be confessed in silence and privacy before study the Word of God. When you study the Word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus and his Last Supper taught him in John 14, 15, and 16 that the Holy Spirit would have the ministry of teach and recall of the Word of God in your life. John 14, 26, 27, at 25, 26, 27, something like that. You need to, be, you need to really be aware of that. Now, don't need, Listen, teach means there's a class time. Recall means there's a life experience time. When it says he will teach and recall, it means there's a time in class and there's a time in recall in personal life. And how, 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 how dynamic is that? When you're in a situation and you're thinking, oh, what, what is it? And the Holy Spirit gives you the word of God at the right time and the right moment. It's just dramatic, isn't it? And the other person that you give it to goes like, whoa, I needed that. And you walk away and you thank the Lord for it because you were struggling to try to pull something up. And if you just relax and let the Holy Spirit put it up, it'd be right on the money. So let's have a word of prayer. Remember, 1 John 1, 9 for, tells us that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That's the work of Christ on the cross to the personal life of a believer. So I give you a moment to do that. Father, how thankful we are for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. 
Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our souls today about not just starting missions, but supplying all that we can that's necessary to keep the boots on the field working for the cause of Christ. They will go under afflictions because we are tempted, not necessarily from a sin nature, but from the tempter, the evil one, Satan. He is the God of this world. And we are not of this world anymore. We have been redeemed from it. We are in it, but we're, we are not of it. And so we pray today you would teach us, Father, the church's responsibility and care and compassion for the work on the mission field in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, what we're talking about applies to any mission field. What I'm going to talk about today would apply to the mission field. We have some home missions going on. Uh, John Dyer's got an excellent ministry uh, out in the Moody area, as well as foreign mission trips that we have, like the Broadheads, the Mr. and the Mrs. Uh, they, they have wonderful ministries uh, in the other parts of the world, and they come back home. Then we have other missionaries out there. They put the boots on the field, and they don't leave it. Uh, you know, the Morgans uh, close to all of us in the Philippines. I mean, that's, that's like one of our own children, you know. For some of you, it is, but I mean, it's some wonderful things. Well, anyhow, uh, let me remind you, uh, Easter will be back on full swing. Uh, so... Be mindful of that. We're in a one service yet until Easter, and then we start our back. We have two sessions with a break in the middle. And so I want to remind you, we will stay on our Wednesday schedule until May, and then we'll come back to our luncheon on Wednesdays, or whatever you decide. We've got it open. You, there's things back there. You can pick a Monday. You can pick a, um, I don't know, I told you, I don't know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or whatever. You can pick one of those days during the week and the hour, whether you want to meet in the morning, uh, like a lunch, or if you would like to meet in the ev early evening, we can have a dinner at a midweek. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. I'm free. So it's what's best convenient to you, and we'll let you get an idea, and then we'll pick out what we think is the, the best out of all of that. So there are little things back there that you can fill out and turn in and we would like to have a, an input back there because my time is your time, so we'll, we'll work on it. Well, let's look at five things this morning about uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5, Paul's concern for missions. Point number one, I want to begin by breaking down the third chapter, verses 1 through 5, into three sections. I call them homiletical points just to get familiar with the passage. I've already read it to you. Uh, but there, there are three parts that I think are important for you to recall. I put them with T's, Timothy, uh, teaching, and tempter. Uh, uh, Paul, Paul is deeply concerned about them, and so he, he's decided to send Timothy back into the heat of the battle. Uh, he thinks that maybe it's calmed down enough, but it's still the heat of the battle. The last time he was there, they ran him out of town. So he, he, he has decided to send Timothy back in because he could, he, could, he could stand it no longer, not knowing how they're faring in the midst of afflictions. That is the angelic conflict. I'm talking about when, he, when you have the word afflictions, you're talking about what it's, what it's intended to produce upon the people it's attacking. Afflictions. It's not about the warfare. It's about the afflictions that the warfare, what, what the warfare is intended to do on the person. And so you have the word afflictions. It's, it's, it's what they're capable of doing to put suffering on you. And um, they can do it legally, uh, forcibly. They can do it ri with riots. They, do it, they try to do it politically. They try to do it um, 
legally. Uh, they do it with riots. Um, they assassinate. They will do hits on people. They will kill people. You know, they'll go through a system, and sometimes you have one leads to another, like they'll do the legal system, and they say, if you preach in war, I'm going to put you into, I'm going to put you in jail. And they go like, well, look, I got to preach, so. So they go into jail, let them out, put them in jail, let them out. Then finally they say to them, uh, well, look, the legal system is not going to keep them from doing it, so what else can we do? Then they riot against them. If that doesn't work, then they assassinate them. That's what they did with Stephen. They kill him. Sometimes they do it quietly. They tried to kill. They tried, they tried to assassinate Jesus. They tried to assassinate Paul. Uh, they couldn't get him because these, they, like all believers, you die on God's timing, not man's. You should know that. The world doesn't, but you should know that. That's an inside information that you should know. So he's going to send Timothy back because he can't stand any longer. He just needs to know about these because he feels like he left them orphans. Felt like he left them orphans. And he, he feels bad about that without, without spiritual parenting. And he feels, he, it's, he's just, it's really bothering him. So he sends back Timothy. He tells, and Timothy has two assignments. One is to strengthen and encourage them in the word of God, in their faith. And te te see where they are, how they're dealing. Try to fix it up. And then try to develop what is necessary right there before he gets run off or has to leave, and then to write a report that he's got to take back to Paul. So he's got a couple assignments here uh, that Paul wants from Timothy in verses 1 and 2, which we read. In verses 3 and 4, uh, he's, he's, in God, he's involved in a couple things. He's got to teach, but remember that when you have the word affliction, now you know that when somebody says, said, well, what's wrong with you? And said, well, I have an affliction, right? People talk that way, don't they? I talked to Rocky this morning. He has an affliction. Uh, you know, a suffering, uh, an aspect in his life of suffering, and, and, it, and it's an affliction. And, um, and hopefully you can get help for it. If not, then you deal with it from a biblical standpoint. When the, you, you work medicine and you work the Word of God at the same time. And you can find resolve in that. Now, an affliction, and so he, he's going to go back and listen what he has to do, Timothy has to do. He's got to go back because a lot of them been in affliction. The devil's going to put affliction on you. It can make your life miserable in a lot of different ways. It doesn't, it's not always physical. It could be in their business and their families. It could be, put in prison for no, no cause, no reason, no nothing. We're headed there. Let me tell you, if the church doesn't get on the stick and get their head in the Word of God and the Word of God in other people's heads, you're going to find out what all of this is about. America has been, the church in America has been sheltered by the grace of God. And so... He, one job is he's got to be like a, a spiritual medic. He's got to go in there and he's got to deal with the wounded, those who have been afflicted by the cause of Christ. They, they've become discouraged. They've been, you know, they've been poked and, 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 and picked on and, and, and no telling what all. And so he's got to deal with all of those, the wounded, the walking wounded. He's got to deal with those. That's kind of your, Jackie, that's your ladies' conference this year. The ladies' conference is dealing with that kind of a subject. That's what he's, that's what he's actually doing when, he, when it says affliction. So he's got to go in there as a spiritual medic. He's got to deal with those people who have been seriously wounded. Their life have been destructed, uh, destroyed, their businesses. I mean, we're getting a little taste of this right now. They'll use any excuse to do it, and they'll use any excuse to keep it going. Have we not learned that? Please tell me you've learned that during this crisis. These people will never let a good crisis go to what? 
Jeez, have we not learned that? Listen, that's affliction. This stuff is already happening to us. You need to have your eyes open. This is already going on. They've already experimented with shutting churches down. Just like businesses, they've gone after it all. They've wanted to see. They've tested the waters in this crisis. And what they've done, listen, we went from a, from a typical crisis to an affliction. What they're doing with businesses is ungodly and unspeakable. And the schools, so much for science. Listen, what is it if it's, if it's so far out? Listen, you always know when it's evil, it's in your face, and you don't know what to do with it. We're going to learn what to do with it one way or the other. I'm going to try to arm you. Boy, we're going to have to be really understanding how to fight evil. This war is not about sin. It's about evil, and by now you should know it because they're in your face. I say yours, I mean they're in our face. I'm not excluded from that, I can tell you. I may just be aware of it a little more. So he sent Timothy in, and Timothy's got two responsibilities to the congregation. He's got to help the wounded who's been wounded in their life, and, are, and they're wondering if this believing in Jesus Christ is worth it. You understand that? These young believers wondering, listen, is it worth it? The losses I had in my life, is it worth it? And Timothy's got to go in there and try to restore that. And so he's got, he's got a, whole, a whole section of the army of God that's wounded that he has to get back on his, their feet. He's got the other people who are on their feet and fighting the f battle. He's got to deal with them. And he's got to, in the meantime, write a great report back to to take back to Paul, and he's got to give an estimate on when he gets ready to leave, what kind of condition he's left them in to fight the good fight of faith. He's got quite a task, hasn't he? Plus, he's a target in the midst of all of that. He's a target. What a wonderful thing it is. Listen to me. <laughs> What a wonderful it is to be able to pastor a church that has the maturity of people that you can do that with. You can send the Timothys in. And we have such a church. And you should be proud of that. We do have Timothys. We have a lot of them. We have the Timothys, both of the male and the female, that have that capacity and capability. And I'm, I'm going to tell you... You know, it's the family you're part of as a church family. You don't probably realize most of the time how tremendously blessed you are to be a part of a church that is spiritually mature, that has so much doctrine, that you can send people out to help the wounded and do all these things. And we do it. And we're, we're glad to share it, and we're glad to do it. It's part of our ministry. That's in verse 3 and 4. In verse, verse 5, the tempter, he introduces to his tempter. And guess what the tempter does? He tempts. Right? And so notice the, notice the words in verse 5, the tempter testing or tempting. In the Greek language, see, it's the same word. Right? It's, it's like I tell you all the time, write the word devil on your paper and then mark through the D, and you know where evil comes from. Evil doesn't come from man. It comes from Satan through man. Like good. Good comes from God. Right? Intrinsic good comes from God. Well, the tempter, he is the enemy. And listen to this. The enemy was already on the field when Paul went there. The enemy, listen, the enemy owned the field. He owned the field. 1 John 5, 19, God of this world. 
the enemy, listen, God sent, God, listen, God sent Paul onto the enemy's field. To do what? To rescue those who were captive and transfer them over into the kingdom of the beloved son through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul did it. And that little group of people now are being hit by the guy that owned the field. In other words, he thought he did. He learned he didn't, but he always believes he does. The tempter, the tempter that tempts the new convert in their faith. And Paul said, I worry about it so that our labors do not go in vain. You know what that means? It means empty of pursuing God through the word of God, empty of pursuing the things of God. You know, John 16, 33, in the world you will have what? Tribulations. But be, be, be encouraged. I have overcome the world. Hmm? In Christ you have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But in Christ you have peace. And you can become an overcomer because of it. In Christ you're an overcomer. An overcomer. That word is used a lot. John is one of John's favorite words. Point number two. The one who leads the ministry on the mission field is responsible in the beginning for the spiritual growth stability of, a, of the believers. You will fear, hear this word a lot from Paul about his mission work. He uses the word it's kind of, it's kind of, you kind of don't see the power of the word. He says, we thought it best. It is E-U and D-O-K-E-O. -E it's a mindset. It's a mindset idea. And Paul has a vision of what, the mission field should become. You go in, you take converts off from Satan's territory, you go in and attack with the gospel of Jesus Christ and get the positive volition, those who are interested in God and what God has to say, you find those people, you share the gospel with them, they get saved. They believe that Jesus died for their sins personally, was buried and raised from the dead. They believe that, they get saved. Then you teach them what that means. You teach them about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You teach them how faith is important to their life. There are certain doctrines they must learn right away. And hopefully, by the time Timothy gets back, those who have survived... He's going to be able to teach them about spiritual gifts. He's going to teach them that some of you have our communicators. Some of you are evangelists. Some of you are our teachers. And he's going to engage them. And they're going to take up a lot of slack for what Paul feels in his heart was missing when he had to leave and why he sent Timothy back. And Timothy's not coming off that mission field until that's secured for sure. The body of Christ has to understand that they're a unit. They're a fighting unit against the devil. And they have to be of one mind and one soul and one spirit. And the only thing that can do that is the word of God and the Holy Spirit. And it is the word of God that's a high, that's the high player on how well you get stabilized, whether or not you can fight the good fight of faith. And so Timothy has quite a job in there. And uh, he's not coming off the field until he, they have a clear understanding of spiritual gifts. And, and, and what he is hopeful, what Paul is hopeful, 
is for Timothy to be able to identify guys who have the gift of teaching an evangelist and do special training on them so that when his boots leave, they got boots on the field. Sure enough, got boots on the field. That's really a key to this. This is really a key to what Paul is trying to teach the church and what we need to understand. So milk doctrines are, are very important, 1 Peter 2.2. 2. Milk doctrines are very important for baby believers and basic meat doctrines for, the, for the, the, the Christian way of life, the CWL, the Christian way of life. I mean, these people have got to really under, have enough information on the Holy Spirit to understand the dynamics. We live in the church age of the new covenant. That's a whole ministry of the Holy Spirit. You got to walk in the Spirit, and you got to walk by faith, and you, you got to wear the armor, you got to fight the good fight of faith, and all of these things. And there are just things that Timothy has to teach because now they're ready. He's got to help the wounded, get them back on their feet with a weapon in their hand. He's got, to, he's got to reestablish teaching to make sure that everybody's got their bases good, they're secure in their salvation and that stuff. He's got to take them to the, another level of, spirit, of the spiritual life about the church. We're a body of Christ. He's got to get them into what we would call 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. He's got to talk about spiritual gifts and then begin to identify, get them to begin to identify them and he, then he's got to begin teaching the meat doctrines before he can get off that church field this time. That's a, that's a, that's a big task. That's a big task. And uh, Paul is not going to be at ease with him coming back and not being able to give a report that that's true. And Paul wants some boots on the field. I need to have somebody that can be an instructor uh, an instructor, a teacher for those people that we, we can feed them information and they can feed them information. I need somebody in there that I can write to, they can write back to me, I can see what they need and we can operate this way. Is a, this is a big task. It's a big task. This second trip, this second trip in was required since there was still and intensity of the angelic conflict, and we're not knowing how the fight's going. Paul is not sure how well the fight's going. And so a second trip is necessary because he's afraid things are going to come unraveled because of the afflictions. And so he sends a, a second trip was necessary. Paul felt that he needed to reinforce these young believers spiritually. And he wasn't sure there were, that that was going to be able to be done without a second trip in. Point number three: Note how Paul viewed the relationship with both those on the mission on his mission team and those on the mission field, the believers. For the mission team, he says, "I send to you Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker." That's a high a high recommendation from Paul. Paul says, I send to him, I send him to you because I have emptied my whole team out. Now, Paul's got a pretty good-sized team by now. And Paul says, I am alone in my ministry at Athens because I've emptied my team out, sending them to different places, and he has. He's been sending guys off from his team back to different mission fields that were having trouble. Some required a third trip on Asia, on the field, the, mission, the different missions on Asia, some up there in Archaea and, and uh, uh, Macedonia. I mean, he's just, he said, I'm alone. I, I don't have... I, I, have, I have sent all, all of the team members that I normally have with me to build on my, on my field. I'm in Athens. Now, if you know anything about Athens out of the book of Acts, things didn't go well in Athens for them. But, uh, but you could, might explain some because he was, 
he had he had no team. He usually goes into places with a team who's just working like crazy all over the place. He didn't have it. it it's, it's just kind of interesting to those who are interested in other aspects like the book of Acts compared them to things going on in the books Paul writes. In 1 Timothy 2.11, Paul wrote, just as you know how we were exhorting courage and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. That's the way Paul felt about all of his mission fields. When Paul was forced to leave only after three weeks, he felt like he had left them orphans. We read about that earlier. I wrote the notice that Greek word, look for the word orphan, and you have it. Point number four. It is the responsibility of the mature mission team leader to be sure that that should be a that, that specific basic doctrines are being taught to young believers. Listen, they had a real, listen, their, their church is growing. The, the people are out in the midst of all this affliction. They're winning people to Christ. This little church is going to be instrumental in the conversion of what today we call Greece. Think about that. This little church. And they're winning converts and trying to help them the best they can. And so they've got all kinds of different things going on in the church. It's why Paul feels so important that it is so important to send back Timothy to get an evaluation and uh, to, to, to give proper leadership. Milk doctrines of salvation are necessary for stabilizing in the Christian way of life. You have, you've got to have the milk doctrines. They are, that's basic training to put on the full armor of God. You know, if you go in the military, they put you through basic training before they hand you a weapon. And listen, they're really smart. They don't hand you a weapon until you've been several weeks proven to be able to be given one and be and it be safe. I thought it was kind of interesting when I was in the military that they handed me a live anger hang, grenade before they handed me a live weapon. I thought that, in my mind, I went, hmm. They handed me, and it was live, too. You pulled the pin and threw it, and went, boom. And uh, there's always a guy you know you shouldn't give that to. And there's always a guy you know, and you do not want to partner with that guy. I mean, you'll, you'll play sick or anything not to, not to get where he is with a live one. Well, there's basic training that's milk doctrines in order to put on the full armor of God. There has to be basic training, and those milk doctrines are essential to basic training to put on the full armor of God and be a soldier, to be a soldier, to be a soldier. So I, I want to mention to you seven basic milk doctrines that I think are important. Seven milk doctrines I think would be important. You need to teach them the essence of God. Everybody knows God and doesn't know anything about him. You need to do that with people in America as well. You need to teach the essence of God. You need to teach a Godhead. And you need to teach how the Godhead is involved in salvation. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God. For example, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son into the world that whoever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life. That ought to be a preference. John, the 16th chapter, 7 through 11, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world of sin, 
righteousness and judgment. Need to teach how Jesus Christ hung on a cross as the Son of God. 100% deity and 100% humanity hung on a cross, became our sins under perfect humanity. So that when he said is finished, the work of salvation was completed for time and eternity. That needs to be taught. They, they need to understand uh, how God becomes your Abba Father at salvation. Romans 8th chapter, 15 through 17. That, that, was, a, that was enormous for me. Now, I, you know, I was raised without a father, so this became a huge doctrine to my life that I had an Abba Father, a, a, a daddy over my life that, that cared for me in the most extreme ways. That was a very big point for me. Uh, the same ideas in Galatians 4, 4 through 7, you should be familiar with that. There ought to be clarity of man's need for salvation. All members of the human race have a need for salvation. Why? Because of Adam's sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. Need to know that. I mean, do you know that? You know why you need to be saved? It's not because you sin, it's because you're a sinner. 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ came into the world to save sinners. You're a sinner. You sin because you're a sinner. I mean, what does this, listen, you write the word sinner on your paper. Circle the first three letters. Is that simple enough to get? You sin because you're a sinner. Christ came into the world to save the sinner. Listen, how did I become a sinner? Because I sinned? No, I became a sinner because I was born as a human being. You know, we forgot today in America that we're all human beings. You know what the church should be preaching from the top of the top of the church? Galatians 3, 26 through 28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, male nor female. We are all one in Christ. We are all one in Christ. There's no black and white in Christ. Everybody, everybody wants to make a big deal. Well, this Jesus, he must have been a Caucasian. He was a Jew by birth. But you know what he did for you? He took that whole argument away. Because in Christ, he's neither Jew nor Gentile. Black or white, it's not the issue. The issue is you're in Adamic sin and can be only rescued by the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Do you know that? Quit listening to the world lie to you. Why don't you go to the Word of God and seek the truth? No black and white in Christ. There's, there's, no, there's no Mexican there's no ethnic group in Christ. I grew up in the North. Everything was, it was not racial in the North. It was ethnic. There was a, a little sweet girl I wanted to date, date who's, who was Polish. Lived in Rothbury a Polish community. I was from New Era, a Dutch community. And that Hollander was not going to marry that Polak. Therefore, don't even think about dating her. So I never could go to the door and knock and say, I'd like to see Connie. Because what I'd see is probably her dad, and I didn't want to see her dad. It wasn't nothing about racial. There was ethnic. I, my Polish girl is not going to date that 
that Hollander. I got to do it. I never thought that way, neither did she. You know, we were, we were just early hormonal teenagers. You know, think about that stuff. Parents did, though. But in Christ, none of that's true. None of that is true. None of that. All that, all that gobbledygook that the devil tempts you with, all that gobbledygook is thrown out. My, my, my. So I wrote all this on your paper. There needs to be a clarity of the gospel even to those who are saved. Why? So they can lead, lead some other people to Christ. They have to have clarity. A lot of people know they got saved, but they're not quite sure how all that worked because, geez, I don't know. So they have to go through a class on the gospel that he died for your sin, was buried from the dead, yada, yada. The clarity of God's security. You know, security of your salvation is with God. Assurance is with you. You need to separate those ideas because everybody gets crazy. Security is always in, the, in God. John, my favorite passage is John 10, 28 through 30. You're in the hands of, it's at salvation. You're put in the hands of Christ. Christ is in the hands of God. Nobody can remove you from that. I mean, that was simple to me. I got like, pff, got that. He said, if you can find anybody bigger that, that can beat Jesus and God arm wrestling, you can have them. There ain't nobody big enough. Nobody big enough. <laughs> Clarity of the believer's assurance comes from the word of God. I love John 20, 31. It says, it has been written for you. That when you believe the gospel of Christ, you are eternally saved. It's also in, in 1 John 5, 13. It has been written for you. Why? To give you assurance that your salvation is secured with God, not with you. I mean, my God, think how. I mean, some days I didn't know who I am. You ever have those kind of days? I, like, boy, I wish this day was over. And you look at your watch, and it's only 10 o'clock. Whoa. That's something. That undeserved suffering needs to, needs to be explained. Undeserved suffering. Philippians 129. Now let me close in point five, because I know you're getting restless. The tempter, who is Satan, is always on the prowl. Circle that word prowl. And, he, and listen, he disguises himself. You know, you ought to read 2 Corinthians. He disguises himself as an angel of light. Now, I don't know what that means to you. I've never seen one. Except I get the idea because he's the angel of darkness. He's the angel that lies all the time. <laughs> so I know that when he disguises himself, he's calling evil good, and lies truth. <laughs> you see, I'm just, I'm just a hick. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just a kid out of the north from nowhere. And yet I figured that out. I, I say that to tell you there's hope for all of us. He prowls around. He prowls around. In Job... Is it, he said, I've been roaming to and fro the earth. New Testament says he's prowling. You know what he's trying to do? He's, he's a lion looking for a prey. The word prowl. He, he, he's not trolling to and fro like that. In the New Testament, because of the intensity of the angelic conflict, he's prowling prowling. He's a lion on prowling on attack, looking for prey. Yeah, come on now. We know that's true. Listen to 1 Peter 5, 8 through 10. 
Be of sober, sober spirit. Be on the alert. See, I, I, I put bold print. Did bold, you got the circle the word be? It, this is very important. Be of sober spirit. Take what I'm telling you seriously. Listen to me and take this seriously. Because you are prey in the devil's world. Take me serious. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. I mean, if the police came or in your neighborhood and was, you saw them knocking on every door and saying that there was a lion loose and had already killed somebody down the street, are you with me? Would you be on the alert? Or would you be out front going, kitty, 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 kitty. I mean, even common sense tells you. Even common sense tells you that if there's a lion on the prowl ready to devour you, you ought to take that serious, and you ought to be on the alert. Is that sensible? Then why aren't we sensible? Then why aren't we sensible? I don't know. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. What's my responsibility? After being sober spirit and being alert, resist him firm in your faith knowing that the same experience and sufferings are being accomplished by your brethren who are all over the world. You know what that means? He's got a pretty big army. Now think about that. He probably leaves the north in the wintertime and come south, so you know it's going to be heavy in the, in the wintertime down here, right? He, he's going to come with the snowbirds. Listen, all over the world! When he tells you about his army in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verses 11 and 12, you ought to take it serious! After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who calls you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. D listen to that. You ought to circle. He himself. Do you love that? God will never leave you farther then you're capable of fighting. He'll want you to fight the good fight of faith. That fight brings him glory. And when he sees that you've gone to your, your extent, you know what he does? He intervenes. He pulls you off. He pulls you off the war field and gives you a little R&R. &R. And put you back on it. That's what, that's what Paul is trying to do with Timothy. That's what his concern is in the angelic conflict. It is my concern for you. Even those of you who are all over the world with us today. By the internet. That's my desire for you. Be of good courage. Christ has overcome the world and the enemy within it. What he's looking for is warriors who will study the word of God, who will take it serious, who will build a life where they can stand on their own two feet, the faith of the word of God. And that is my prayer for you. It should be your prayer for me. 
So let's have a word of prayer. Remember, if you uh, have an offering to leave, just leave it as you leave back there. Always remember this meal has been paid for by the grace of those from yesterday to today. And um, we don't pass it around anymore right now, so just drop it off on your way out. It, and you know it's appreciative. You know we appreciate to keep this, keep this operation going. Let's have prayer, and then Rick will dismiss us in a pledge to the flag. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way for this hour of study out of 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5. Thank you for Paul's concern, Father, and putting it in print that ran through your approval for our lives. And how wonderful it is to know that which was written in days long ago is still prevalent for our life today in the 21st century. Ah, we thank you so much, Father. You are so faithful to us. Teach us, Father, to stop being childish in the way we think, to grow in the word of God and become stable young men and women, called to great ministry of the Lord, to find what God, what place of service God has chosen for you today. I pray this in the name of Jesus.